So moving on to item G, which was uh, developing a process. Let's see, here we are there. Okay, developing a process to access level three force cases. I think we heard from uh, 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 Attorney Van Meter earlier in the meeting that she's willing to participate in this process. Uh, I think what it, what we where we stand right now is we have uh, we have the. I think we've got we've arrived at kind of a working uh, situation, which is to review use of force cases that are not uh, officer-involved shootings, with the information of, that's been made available primarily in PowerPoint presentations. And I believe that there was a further caveat then that if we saw that we could not come to a decision with that information, that we could then uh, bring these up at the next at the board meeting where that case was on the agenda. And ask for for more information. Uh, from in one in the one case where we did um, where we had an officer involved shooting, it sounds like there's a lot of uh, potential in, you know, pen, potential uh, video uh, tape or I'm sorry video recordings, which <clears throat> would be almost as difficult to determine which ones were relevant as to, you know, and then redact those as it, you know, as it would be just to furnish everything redacted. So, uh, so what I'm looking, you know, what was suggested, I believe, was that um, uh, uh, Director Harness, in, his, in reviewing the case at Force Review, had a better uh, feeling for what information would be useful to provide to the board in addition to the PowerPoint presentation. So that's, I think, where I stand is where I'd like to, you know, start consideration as to whether that's a workable solution to this problem is to ask Director Harness for uh, his opinion in terms of whether there is additional information which should be presented to the board in reviewing these cases. So I ask for some, you know, input from Director Harness and uh, Ms. Van Meter. Uh, Chair Dr. Cass, I think the solution just popped into my head. Um, with every forced review case, the materials that are provided to the reviewers prior to the forced review, forced review board hearing them, uh, there is a list of what is called pertinent OBRDs. So perhaps that's probably the starting point. So if it's listed as pertinent OBRD for any particular case in which you want to review the investigative file, I think start with that list and most likely that should be enough information by which you're able to reach a conclusion. Ms. Van Meter, do you have, uh, would you like to weigh in on this? I think that's probably a very good um, parameter to use, and you always have the option of requesting more videos if you review them and still have questions. But you know, this is uh, that's the determination that is made by the Internal Affairs Force Division um, or the SOD when they review it. I don't, I'm not entirely sure if you necessarily get that information. Um, and that helps the board, the, the force review board, determine which videos to to start with as well. So um, I think it's a, good, a very good place to start. Yes, Member Nixon. Um, who determines, um, Director Harness? Who determines whether a video is considered pertinent OBD, OBRD? Chair Dr. Cass, Member Nixon, that's uh, determined by the uh, presenter of the Force Review Board presentation. Uh, it would be a decision made by the Force Division. Uh, I might add, we, we already rely on a lot of the uh, judgment of the Force Division as to what, you know, how in terms of the investigation that was that was conducted, and uh, so I mean, we have to we have to trust that there's been a you know you know a reasonable investigation, and that we can, if there isn't one, that we can 
somehow determine that based upon the you know the material that they that they give us, which is you know a little bit, um, but well, there's a, there's a certain element of trust involved here, and it seems it seems to me that until it's uh, misappropriate, you know, you know, it's not appropriate that that might be a way you know that we can go. Um, yeah, Chair Dr. Cass, if I might just interject, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, with every force review board uh, case information um, in the on the list of pertinent uh, OBRD, there is also a link to all of the other OBRD that are stored at evidence.com. Um, I have not found an occasion where the pertinent list isn't enough to reach a conclusion. Would you repeat that, please? I said I have not found a time when the pertinent list was not adequate to reach a conclusion. Thank you. Okay, so if I understand you correctly, for all intents and purposes, um, there is a way to get to whatever video we deem necessary in investigation to, to look further. Chair, Dr. Cast Member Nixon, yeah, absolutely, because they're all they're all going to be in an investigative file on evidence.com uh, as far as uh, all of the evidence related to the investigation. Um, but for review, there is a list of pertinent OBRD for a particular officer uh, for a particular incident and it takes you directly to that video uh, for that involvement. And uh, it's, uh, I, I haven't had to go to the supplemental list, which is down below, which is a link to the evidence file in evidence.com uh, in order to be able to reach a conclusion for my review. Okay. And, and Director Harness, do you know if there is an SOP, a policy, that governs the process of redacting video? Uh, Chair, Dr. Cass, Member Nixon, uh, yes, there is a policy regarding redacting video, um, but that is for public publication um, and the dissemination. There is no, there is a, uh, so, yeah, there is a policy. Um, you can go on to Power DMS and you can look at the redaction policy uh, for the OBRD. It'll be in 2-8. Thank you. Member Romeo Pruitt. And so for redaction purposes, are we as a board considered the public? Or are we considered some other entity that has a different level of redaction? Uh, Chair, Dr. Cass, Member Armio Pruitt, you're actually held to a lesser standard than the public uh, because if the public were to re request this video via IPRA, it would not be redacted uh, to uh, conceal officer identity. Um, you're held to that standard by the collective bargaining agreement uh, because you are not to know the identity of the officers that you are reviewing. And do we have an internal policy about our um, ability to to know who the, like, is there, like if I as a citizen said, I'm gonna IPRA, I would like to IPRA this video and then I watch it, but I'm also on this board and I am judging the you know, voting on the findings of these cases, would I be in violation of anything? Chair, Dr. Cass, member Armio Pruitt, yes, you'd be in violation of your confidentiality responsibilities and your responsibilities to adhere to the collective bargaining agreement with the APOA. Member Galloway. Also, probably in not conducting outside investigations, 
our own investigations would probably fall under that as well. Um, do we know if the new stipulated order is going to affect the FRB process as it stands now? Can we postpone that discussion until we get to the next item on the agenda? Sure. I guess I would think that it might fall under this one as well, though, hence the ask. Well, I mean, I... I mean, if the FRB process is going to change as a result of the stipulated order, then I would think that this conversation is premature. I guess that would be my point. Yes, uh, uh, Ms. Van Meter. Thank you, Chair Dr. Cass and Member Galloway. The, the stipulated order does not change the FRB process and won't affect this question at all. Thank you. Okay, is there any other any other discussion about this? Um, we, we, I'm not sure that we need to, we need a motion. I think what we're looking for is to try to you know work out a process. Uh, Member Olivas, you have a comment? Yeah, just a little bit confused on one portion of what was said there. We are held to a standard in the collective bargaining agreement but we are not a party to the collective bargaining agreement. So I'm, I'm a little bit curious about that dubious assertion that we ought to be held to it. Uh, Chair Dr. Cass, uh, Member Olivas, uh, absolutely we are a party to the collective bargaining agreement. We were represented by the city of Albuquerque in that negotiation and we are held to those standards. That's exactly where the timelines come from for investigations or discipline. So absolutely, we are held by the collective bargaining agreement. It is a basis for much of how we conduct the CPOA investigations. But my, my point, I think I know the answer to this. It's a question at the same time, because I'm not certain, is do we have anyone at that table where those negotiations occur uh i believe that our that our uh, city councilors may be part of that um i'm not i'm not certain if that's if that's correct no um but no one from the agency obviously not yourself i don't think anyone on the board was was physically present or or solicited <clears throat> uh chair dr cast member of Levis, no you're correct we were not a part of the negotiation and um, years ago, I argued that we didn't have privity with the CBA, therefore we should not be held liable to it and for it. However, the city uh, maintained that because the CPOA is a city organization employed with city employees, therefore they negotiate on our behalf. However, we are uh, quasi-independent, uh, so I, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of gray area in there, clearly. What are you, if you, obviously this is off the, you know, off the top of your head, but what, are there similar standards in, in other jurisdictions? Are there similar jurisdictions, similar size and similar situations? Sure, Dr. Cass, member Nixon, which standards do you mean? Do you mean, are the oversight agencies a part of the uh, collective bargaining agreement negotiation team? Correct. Uh, I'm only aware of one uh, oh. such entity, and that's uh, the Seattle Community Police Commission at this point. So it is it is possible, at least. It, it, it has occurred in some community, though it, it's probably not widespread, at least not to your knowledge. Uh, that would be correct. Yeah, Member Nixon. Um, and, and is it me or does it seem like that policy kind of hamstrings us from <laughs> investigating? We've already established that <clears throat> we can get access to any of the video that we we um, request, but is there anything that you guys see where that's going to hamstring us with the stipulation that uh, member Armijo Pruitt had um, kind of brought up as far as independent investigation per se. 
member, uh, Chair Dr. Cast member, uh, um, the irony of this is not lost on even the city clerk. And we've had discussions about the, the irony of the public being able to get more access to information than the oversight body. It is, it is a consideration that the city clerk has pledged to bring to the negotiating parties for the CBA. Um, and I have since day one in being here argued that the CBA and the 90 days with the one with the one time extension for 30 days is a hindrance to fact finding for investigations. And I've been pounding that drum since I've been here. Um, and uh, there's allegedly some movement on that with the CBA negotiations, um, but it is something that um, there's no traction at this point. Council Van Meter. Uh, member Cass, I'm sorry, President Cass and Dr. Cass and Member Olivas, it's late. <laughs> Your meetings last way too long. Um, the uh, yeah. I have had discussions uh, with Director Harness about some proposed um, uh, terms that I think might make a potential MOU with the APOA more palatable, palatable to them with regard to this particular term and condition. So, so there's two issues. First is, as we've discussed, the pertinent OBRD issue, and that's kind of a, until we get this other potential option sorted out, right? So the pertinent OBRD list um, will be assuming we do have to go through and do all the rate actions. Um, if we can sort out this other agreement, and I think that in general, it would be helpful if um, the CPOAB would agree to um, make sure not to share officers' names during board meetings, make sure not to share video during board meetings and those sort of issues, um, then we can uh, present that information to the APOA and that might make them feel a little bit more comfortable with not redacting officers' names from the materials provided to the CPOA B for purposes of making your decisions. So uh, with regard to this particular issue, um, I, I, I'm hoping to find a way forward that will make it less burdensome on the staff at APD with regard to producing the videos, give you a little bit more information and um, will make the APOA and CPOA be happy. It's uh, always a challenge to get everybody on the same page, but we're, we're working on it. So what action would you suggest on the part of the CPOAB to, uh, you know, assist in this process? For right now, um, there, there's two things. So one, if you are all okay with me letting APD know uh, with that particular case that you've already requested the video, they can maybe, sh maybe should focus on the pertinent OBRD video. Um, that's the first item. And then the second item would be, I've got to put together a draft um, MOU to submit to the CPOAB with regard to the treatment of any video. And I've got to continue to work with the APOA to reach that agreement uh, with regard to allowing sharing of officer identity information. Uh, but this is something that you would, you would initiate. And if, I mean, we, we can agree that you know, we would like to have you work in that direction. Is there anything we need to do to, to help, help that out? Or can we just wait until you've, uh, you've come up with something and, and bring it back to uh, see if that's a workable agreement? Sure, Chair Dr. Cass, uh, we have two options. Either I can be the person to do the first draft of an MOU or, or somebody for the CPOAB can be the, first per the person to do the first draft. I'm fine with either scenario. I am a little bit bogged down with other work right now. So if that would speed things up, I would not object at all to somebody else making the first draft and we can go from there, uh, whichever works best for the board. Well, I, let me uh, defer to Council Gooch if she's, uh, if there's any uh, 
if she can give us some uh, some wisdom here as to what we might do. Uh, I mean, I don't think within the board, I don't think we we're in the position uh, to do that. I think with you know our attorney or uh, that's she certainly is. Um, so let me ask her what what her thought would be. Uh, Chair Dr. Cass, Honorable Board, I I agree that we need to figure out how to move through this. I. I'm not sure how productive it would be to just start with an MOU until we've actually heard from the APOA if this is a starter or a non-starter. Um, I also have concern that I don't want the board to be exposed to any kind of liability, if you will, depending on how the terms of the MOU would be written, given that you all, your board packets and whatnot, are subject to IPRA requests. So there's, there's a lot of parameters I think we can work within. I think maybe the next step is to have Ms. Van Meter, myself, and someone from the APOA have a, have a discussion with Director Harness, maybe the chair, to see where everyone is on the issue, to see if we can get a meeting of the minds before anyone jumps full force into trying to draft something. I, I just, I want to make sure the board is protected. Everyone understands what everyone's roles need to be. Is that a, does that constitute a plan? Uh, Director Harness. Uh, yes, Chair Dr. Cass, thank you. I just had one question. Didn't the board already sign a, a confidentiality agreement with, as an MOU with City Legal that covers this, or did that not get accomplished? I know it was started, uh, so did that not get accomplished? Chair Dr. Cass, Honorable Board, Director Harness, not to my knowledge, I'm, I'm not aware of that ever having been done or finalized or by anyone. Because I think didn't, uh, wasn't Attorney Rose working on that earlier? That was an NDA, I think. Uh, yeah, same thing. Okay, well, no, it fell, you know, they, I think they went on record as not, you know, deciding against that. But, uh, okay. Council Ben Meter, right. I, I, yes, you're the expert. You have the inside information. <laughs> yes, Chair Dr. Cass, uh, Dr. Harness, the that uh, at the time that was not a well received proposal from our uh, on our end. I do think that we can uh, revisit this idea and make sure that it is um, clear what everyone's intentions are here and and potentially move forward that way. Also, my understanding is all of the IPRA requests for CPOA B documentation goes through the city clerk's office, which would ensure that, that all of the information that is um, not disclosable pursuant to IPRA and other public records laws is still going to be screened out during that process. Um, and I am happy to sit down with um, Ms. Gooch, Dr. Harness, um, Chair Dr. Cass, and whoever else needs to be present to to work with the APOA if, that, if we think that that's a a better starting place on this process. Any other comments or discussion? I, I, it, it, it seems to me we've gotten, yes, uh, Member Levis, do you have something? You... Well, I just, I wanted to add here that, you know, part of our commitment as serving on the board and part of the selection process to selecting members to serve on the board is, uh, supposedly to select members who shall be impartial, refrain from prejudgment, shall recuse themselves from any case where they may be a party or may have a conflict of interest or may know an officer or a victim or a complainant. Um, I think that a number of the safeguards that are in place and the, the pledges that we take as members um, are designed to ensure that we not use um, material which is apparently publicly available and is not available to us uh, for some strange reason that we agree not to use that information to prejudge cases or to um, bias against any particular individual or favor any particular individual that's part of the selection process for board members so it, you know, it, it just seems as though we're, you know, we're in a position here of, of having to to 
triply certify that we're not going to do that um, in multiple checks. So I think it, it really puts us as a board at a, at a disadvantage. And I think in many ways, it's, it's a slap in the face to the board uh, that we are not to be trusted with this information um, that as a private citizen, I can freely access for a minimal charge and a minimal inconvenience to myself. But as a board, we're having to wait months and months to do this. And then the additional cost and, and manpower that it requires to redact this material um, at, at the, to what end? I mean, we are we are supposed to be an impartial, unbiased uh, review board. That's my piece. So, uh, Member Nixon, you have something? We're yeah, and, and, and that's kind of one of the concerns, to kind of echo what, what Eric is saying. Um, if you want us to be unbiased and, and be neutral on this, then we should be able to look at anything and everything we need to at some point. I understand that it needs to be redacted to go through this board for some reason, but one of the concerns I have is as an independent board that there seems to be this dependence on APD in one capacity or another to conduct any analysis uh, at the minimal level and, and it just doesn't feel very neutral. It almost feels like, you know, the more of a yes man I am, the better it is as far as what it is we're trying to do. And so when you take away an inalienable right, such as going on to a public place as a private citizen to get any and all OBDR that you can, and then it's limited, it, it does feel like it's being hamstring and biased to the favor of APD, which is definitely not where this board wants to be, in my opinion, just stating my, my feeling. Thank you. I, one, one, I'd like to make one comment, and that is it, I think it's important to identify the source of this. Uh, it isn't just a general source of the city or APD, but it's, uh, it's the collective bargaining agreement, which, which is the main uh, uh, control over what we're talking about here. And that's done by the APOA. So uh, I think it just has to be recognized who, where the, where the, the uh, difference is or where the, where the constraints arise. And it's not a, I think there's, you know, you know, the desire, you know, and it's been expressed by ordinance to create an independent board, but there are restrictions which come from other agreements that are already in place uh, with, the, uh, with the union. And so I think that just needs to be recognized who it is uh, that's created these uh, these constraints on our ability to to oversee, and I and I think this is if, uh, for example, NACOL, This is a common theme uh, that is you know found at NACOL, uh, uh, where oversight agencies have uh, you know difficult difficulty doing oversight because of conflicts with the uh, with union contracts and protections that are built into police unions and it's a it's a fundamental uh, aspect you know challenge associated with doing oversight so uh, I think it's just important to be clear about where these uh, restrictions come because that is uh, that, that's a major source of them so uh, I'd like to you know, I think we have a working plan to go forward and, and uh, you know, attempt to, you know, you know, make some progress in this pro on this problem. Get a, you know, get the information that we can best, you know, within the, all the constraints. So I'd like to move on, you know, close this item out, and uh, uh, have our direct our um, attorney to, uh, you know, make contact with uh, the city attorney, Van Meter, and then we can. You know, uh, go forward from there. So uh, if that's, uh, if there's no further discussion, we will move on.